My name is Deepak Thakral, and uh, we're, we have some very interesting sessions lined up for, for you guys. Uh, we're going to kick off by just giving you a quick introduction about advertising and how the advertising system ecosystem works. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit more about who Chartboost is and how does ad tech at Chartboost work. And then I'll have my colleague uh, Vivek come and talk, give you a lot more in-depth information about Chartboost and about our ad tech ecosystem, about how we utilize Spark, how we utilize Scala. So there's a lot of interesting depth and tech deep dive into each of these topics. And then we leave some time for Q&A, and then we will have uh, Alex from Criteo, which is another advertising technology company, and he's going to give another uh, technical session about how they utilize some of the technology components at Criteo, right? So, oh, what happened to the? I'll go blank. Okay, I think we're good. So, uh, first, just with a sh quick show of hands, how many of you have either worked in advertising technology or are familiar with it? Yes, quite a few. Okay, how many of you use Spark? Okay, good. So. With that, let's, uh, let's kick it off. So first of all, mobile advertising, why it matters, right? We're going to talk about ad tech at scale. How are decisions made in like 100 to 200 milliseconds? The time you take to blink your eye, there are decisions made about who you are, what ad to serve, all of that happens. So we'll give you a quick kind of preview of that. Uh, then I want to talk about chart boost because it'll have, help give you context when Vivek comes in and talks about how we have designed our advertising infrastructure here at Chartboost. And then um, we'll talk about Scala and Spark. What are the use cases? How do we utilize the technology here? And then we we'll leave time for Q&A. Okay. So um, I wanted to first start off by, you know, talking to you about how did advertising evolve, right? There used to be a time when advertising a lot more simpler. And I actually have this ad from the 1960s, which is uh, you'll see very shortly what this uh, ad is about. Um, so I thought I'll start off with something a little bit more fun and, and light. So take a look. I think uh, we need to get the volume up. So this was an actual ad from the 1960s where you could get away with whatever you wanted to say that it actually like has fruit flavor, you know, it reduces calories, it makes you thin, right? But like, you know, advertising has evolved since then. It's become a lot more sophisticated. And the formats have changed. They've gone from live TV to desktop to mobile web to mobile in-app, right? And Coke still continues to advertise, except that it's just, uh, um, Sorry, let me get this uh, out of the way. Um, Coke still continues to advertise, but now the formats have changed, right? And what you see here is Selena Gomez on Snapchat, right? Where the ad is most likely like a vertical video, which is like five seconds long, but it appeals to, to the audience. And then you look at, uh, on the right-hand side is a Facebook ad, which is like a carousel, which shows different Coke flavors, right? So the brand of Coca-Cola has not really changed but it has evolved, and so has advertising. What's more interesting is that the technology that powers this has gone a really long way. So what do we see in terms of technology is that brands and performance are starting to converge, right? And what I mean by that is that there was a time when brands just cared about putting their ads on TV and reaching an audience. They didn't quite know 
how many of their audience actually cares about the ad, how many of them are interacting with the product. But today, what happens is that people have so much of interactivity, the smartphones on their, on their hands, that they can click into it, they can interact with it. So as a result of that, there's a lot more like information about how many people are viewing the ad, so in terms of viewability. What calls to action are being made, right? What interactions are happening? What percentage of people watch 25% of the video, half the video, the entire length of the video, right? This is, there's a lot more analytics coming in. And similarly, you know, there's information that's happening around bidding. So basically, once we know that there is an audience, a user in front of a phone, there is a lot more information available, such as what kind of platform is the user on? Are they a male? Are they a female? Which country are they in? And what are their interests? What kind of demographics are they in? And all that information is utilized, and within like sub-seconds, decisions are made about which is the right ad based on the targeting parameters to show back to the user, right? So there's also information about interests, like what kind of interests do they have? Do they like to play soccer? Do they like to play baseball? Do they like certain kinds of goods? And again, decisions are made based on their interests. Similarly, you know, we create things like lookalike segments, which is once we identify that if you're a user who likes X, then we will utilize machine learning and artificial intelligence to understand what are some other users who also like X, and therefore make and show ads based on that, right? So what you're seeing is that there's certain things like behavioral targeting, and I'll talk a little bit more about how Chartboost uses behavioral targeting, because we have a lot of information about gaming audiences, and we're able to utilize that and say, if you happen to like casino games, then let me show you ads where you're going to see more casino ads, right? So the point I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of data that's happening behind the scenes, and therefore, essentially, a lot of advertising companies are, in essence, big data companies. So they harness all this data, and this is where technologies such as Spark come into play because they help you utilize a lot more machine learning and cloud computing to understand what kind of ads to show to the right person. So why does mobile advertising matter? It matters because there's a lot of dollars going into it. As of 2017, it's projected that we expect to have about $140 billion flowing globally into mobile advertising. And that number only keeps going up, right? So we expect that by 2020, it'll be close to $250 billion, right? And therefore, the next question you might ask is, who dominates this mobile advertising, and what's going on behind it? So what we see here is that three formats dominate mobile advertising. They are search, social, and display. Search, you might be more familiar with. If you're on your phones, you go to Google, it's the dominant form of search advertising, right? Social, we see very clearly that there are a couple of social platforms that dominate mobile advertising, whether it's Facebook, Google, or uh, you know, Twitter, or Snapchat. But the display ecosystem is a lot more fragmented, and we'll show you how display advertising works, right? In terms of, you know, that's kind of the heart of powering ad tech, and how we have this entire ecosystem of demand-side platforms, supply-side platforms, and um, how they are interacting in a real-time auction uh, bidding ecosystem to decide which is the right ad to serve to, to, the, to the user in that publisher. Um, so we talked about social, right? So we definitely have um, Google participating in a lot of ways, but we also have the giants with Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat, and they make up pretty much the dominant form of advertising today, in fact, uh, in terms of social advertising. Um, what we also have is what we call as the programmatic ecosystem. And what you see here is basically audience, which is users, right? And so these users could be in front of different types of websites or different types of mobile sites. Like, they could be in front of apps. So they could be in front of CNN.com or the ABC app. But what's happening behind the scenes is that when a user is on this uh, website or on the mobile app, a request is being made to an ad server. The ad server then has the ability to run an auction and see that do they have their own set of advertisers? If they don't, they will send that ad request to an exchange. An ad exchange works very similar to what you would think of as a, like, let's say, like a stock market, like, like the New York Stock Exchange, where there's automated buying and selling of stocks happening. In the advertising world, an ad exchange is facilitating buyers and sellers and deciding how you can automate the buying and selling of ads. So all of these ad exchanges, like DoubleClick, AppNexus, Rubicon, et cetera, are going to then send that ad request to multiple demand-side platforms. And these demand-side platforms will then make decisions 
based on the machine learning and the big data capabilities that they have as to which are the right campaigns and pretty much in, in a split second will decide that do they want to participate in that auction? What should the bidding price be and how much are they willing to bid to acquire and show an ad to that user? And then from there on, you know, the DSP makes that decision, it represents that advertiser, and then it returns that ad response back. And all of this happens in like about 200 milliseconds. So I thought rather than me just talking about it, we'll actually show you a quick video uh, which shows how the programmatic ecosystem works for advertising, that powers advertising technology in those 200 milliseconds. So. So you could see right there, right? Like in 200 milliseconds, how many different computations are being made, how much of their ad requests flowing through to different entities, like an ad exchange to multiple demand side platforms, and the auction is happening, and then the response comes back. And you as a user, you're just like, you know, scanning the news or whatever, and you see an ad, but you don't realize how much complexity is going behind the scenes to determine what the winning ad should be that showed to you. Right? So with that, um, what I'd like to do is shift gears a little bit and tell you a little bit more about Chartboost and how do we you know, utilize advertising um, and, and a little bit similar to what you saw before in the ecosystem. So as a company, we're backed by Sequoia and TransLink. We have about 100 people between San Francisco and uh, Amsterdam. And as a platform that really helps game developers monetize, we see somewhere between 700 million to a billion unique uh, monthly devices each month. Right? And what that does is that basically we, we help app developers make money, especially like we're the world's largest uh, platform for monetization for gaming audiences. How do we do that? We have our SDK in over 300,000 apps. So basically 90% of the top grossing iOS and Android apps in the gaming ecosystem utilize our SDK. And um, with that, we also have large like gaming studios like EA, Zynga, you know, Big Fish, King, all of them utilize our network to basically drive user acquisition. And so because of this SDK reach, we see between 700 million to a billion unique users. It allows us to create a lot of rich personas about their gaming behavior. So we understand what kind of users tend to like casino apps or what kind of people like, like trivia apps or casual action. And then based on that, we are able to build these kind of rich uh, personas, right, or graphs. So 
Vivek's going to spend more time talking to you about how do we create those graphs, how do we make the right determination about which ad to show. So that's a little bit about us. Um, in terms of our SDK penetration, we're like number two behind Google AdMob uh, in terms of the SDK and how many users, how many app developers use us, not just at the head, but also the torso and the tail. So we have a, a wide reach uh, in terms of our SDK penetration. Um, then the question you might ask is, how does advertising work for a mobile ad network? To simplify it, it's not just Chartboost, but any other mobile ad network. So imagine that there's a user called Joe, and Joe loves to play Subway Surfer. So how many of you play mobile games, by the way? Show of hands, maybe a few, right? So if you're a mobile gamer, you know what you're going to do is you're completely immersed inside this game. And when, once you reach a level, uh, what we'll decide is that, hey, it might be the right time to show you an ad. Or you may also decide that you want to earn some coins to continue into the next level. So when you want to earn some coins, you have a choice. You could watch a video. And that video basically tends to be a promoted video, which is coming from an ad network. So at that time, the mobile game publisher will make a request to the ad network and saying, hey, do you have an ad? And so what we do is we utilize our SDK to then show different ads. And so what you will see is, for example, the Bubble Witch Saga, which is another game uh, that we'll decide to show as an ad or as a video. So what are the different types of ad formats that we have? We basically have what we call as playables, which are more like interactive games. They're like mini games that are built into an, uh, utilizing HTML5 into the ad unit. So that it's almost like a try it before you buy it. The user can decide that they want to interact and play the game. And if they like it, then they'll go to the App Store and install it. Another example of, um, is videos, where people get to basically watch a 10 or 15 second video. They tend to earn some coins. But they like, as they watch the video, they tend to like the game and say, oh yeah, this is something I'm interested in. Let me install it. Right? And then the other one is just a, a, a basically a static banner ad. So what happens is that when people click and go to the App Store and install, as a 100% performance-driven ad network, we only get paid when the user installs the app and opens it up. Right? And so therefore, there's a lot of science that has to go in for us to understand what kind of users are interacting with these ads, what kind of users are actually installing and opening the ad, and how do we create more installs that generate more revenue from us from an advertising technology perspective. So what's happening behind the scenes? What's happening is that all of this information about the user is going through the Chartboost SDK. So information like, what kind of platform is it? Is it an iPhone? What kind of OS is it? Is it an iOS 10 user? Is this person, which country is this person? Is it in the United Kingdom? What game are they playing? What is their IDFA or their unique kind of advertising ID? And then we're taking in all this information, and then it goes to the ad server. The ad server will then say, how many advertisers do I have who are eligible to be considered to show an ad? Right? So we'll make that determination. Then we'll make a request to our ad relevance module, which will then make a determination that of the hundreds of advertisers that may be eligible to serve an ad, which is the ad which has the highest probability of being clicked upon, being installed upon, and we'll use something called as eCPM. So we'll come up with a predictive eCPM. And then based on that highest score, we'll then decide which ad to send. Once that ad gets sent and rendered, then the user may decide to interact with it. If they click and they go to the App Store and install, we have something called as attribution, by which we actually get to know that install happened. And so all of these billions of events that are happening on a daily basis in terms of impressions, clicks, installs, and even post-install metrics, like how many purchases are being made, or what kind of users are coming back to the app on day one, or day seven, or day 14, all of that information is being collected into a data warehouse and being used to compute which is the next ad to show to that user or to an another user. And with that, you know, hopefully you get a better sense of kind of where the advertising ecosystem is. We showed you ads from like the 60s to now. We kind of talked about how programmatic has evolved, where within a, you know, 200 milliseconds, we're able to make decisions about ads. And then we talked a little bit about Chartboost and the mobile advertising ecosystem. So I'm sure you're interested to learn about how we utilize some of these technologies in our, uh, in our technology stack. And for that, I'd love to have Vivek come and talk about, uh, you know, do a, more, uh, a deep dive to this. Thank you. Thanks, Deepak. Thanks, Deepak. My name is Vivek, and I manage the engineering team at Chartboost. And what I was saying was that I really need that Coke from 1960 ad that makes you leaner. Um, pretty interesting ad. Um, I think the, <laughs> Deep, Deepak walked us through 
the chart boost uh, mobile uh, mobile ecosystem and what happens um, uh, in the uh, with the chart boost SDK right now what we would do is uh, go a little bit more into the detail of the technology behind it what happens behind the scenes typical uh, prior to joining chart boost i was with with yahoo for 15 years uh, mostly working in ad tech and what I've seen is that most ad systems have three big components. Uh, one uh, is a web application, where marketers engage with the web application to build campaigns and creators. Then there is like a serving cloud, which is responsible for serving ads. And then the th third is a data cloud, which is responsible for running analytics and machine learning and wh whatnot. Let's look into the chart boost high level architecture what happens like just before this slide deepak showed us what happens between a user playing a mobile device to a chart boost sdk to an ad server serving an ad now let's a little bit uh, dig into what happens behind the scenes inside the chart boost uh, garden um, to begin with uh, an, a, a marketer wants to promote his newly built uh, app he is engaging with this uh, web application and is creating an advertising campaign. Uh, on the other side, a publisher who wants to monetize uh, uh, money, monetize and make money, uh, is going to create a publishing campaign using this web application. Uh, the publisher, in addition, as part of creating the publishing campaign, is going to specify an ad location, what kind of ads need to be shown inside his publishing app. On the other hand, the advertiser is talking about what kind of users he wants to reach, how much he wants to pay for every install, um, and what's his budget. All this information are getting into a, a database. We use Mongo at Chartboost, from where ad server sucks it into in, uh, in memory. So when a user or a gamer is playing a game which has the Chartboost SDK installed in it, that SDK is making a request to the ad server. That ad server is going to perform a bunch of business rules, a bunch of validations, and determine the best performing ad that need to be returned for that ad request. We'll go a little bit more deeper into what that best means, how the ad server determines what the best ad is in the subsequent slides. Later, from there on, the ad server is also emitting a bunch of events slash data into a Kafka. Here, we use Kafka as a message queuing system, which are partitioned by date. All the data are getting into the Kafka, then later sucked into a data warehouse. We use HDFS and Hive as our data mart. Right? And inside the data line, there's a bunch of aggregation pipelines are running, a bunch of machine learning models are running, a bunch of streaming pipelines are running to perform different use cases. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about those in the subsequent slides. And then later on, a bunch of report aggregated metrics are, are generated, which are, which are presented to the advertiser and publisher through different, a set of reports. OK, let's now double click a little bit into what's going on inside ad server and what's going on inside the data, uh, the data slash modeling world. So inside ad server, there are two main parts inside ad server. Um, then the top path is uh, the get, get ad path, and the, the bottom path is the uh, events path. Right? Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit more about the get ad path. The, when the SDK makes a request uh, to get an ad, uh, the chart boost ad server can do one of the two things. It will also it will first try to find uh, an, an advertising campaign that chart boost has. Uh, Chartboost knows about and see if that ad is a, a, a good ad that can be returned for that ad request. Simultaneously, it's also submitting that request to a Chartboost exchange. Chartboost exchange uh, follows OpenRTV and sends that request to a bunch of integrated demand side platforms. Examples include uh, Rubicon, Ad Colony, um, and more. These DSPs may have some advertising campaigns from advertisers that are not directly working with Chartboost. 
it may be an ad from Coke or a Pepsi that are not working with Chartbus yet. And maybe some of these advertisers may be interested in some of our users. And in case they are interested, these DSPs are going to submit a bid for those requests into the Chartbus Exchange. Chartbus Exchange and Chartbus Ad Server are going to determine which is the ad that is going to perform the most money for the publisher, right? And these DSPs compete among themselves as well as with the Chartbus network. And the best performing ad is going to be returned to the publisher. So that's what happens R to the uh, SDK, which gets shown in the mobile, in the gaming app. So that's what happens in the get ad path. In the events path, sorry, before going into the events path, there are a couple of additional things that goes on in the get path. Typical problems or use cases that are addressed in any uh, ad tech or ad server are frequency capping and negative targeting. So most marketers may want to control the number of times an ad is shown to a device, as well as they may not want to show an ad to a device if the device has already installed that app. We call it negative targeting. So to support those use cases, what we do is that we load the last seven days of impression data, that is the data the, about what are the ads that the device had seen in the last seven days, as well as the click data and the install data into a key value store, super fast key value store. We use AeroSpike for that. In the events path, what happens is that typically, unlike the web world, an ad um, is not immediately shown as soon as it is returned to the publishing app. The SDK may choose to cache the ad and decide to show at a later point of time, as decided by the gaming developer. So when the ad is shown, the SDK is emitting a beacon back to the ad server. And similarly, when an ad is clicked or installed, a beacon from an SDK is being sent back to the ad server. And the ad server is emitting all those data again back into Kafka. Okay. So that's this uh, bottom path. The, the more interesting thing that is specific to mobile in-app ecosystem is attribution. What happens is that Unlike the web world, in the mobile world, people pay for, uh, particularly in the mobile in-app world, people pay, pay for installs. And there is a lot of, uh, there is, most of the time, there is a gap between the click and the installs. What I mean by gap, a uh, user may see an ad, may click on an ad, and may go, to, the user is taken to an app store. And in an app store, he may choose to download the app. And by the time the app gets downloaded, the user has gone to do something else. The user has not yet opened the installed app. Right? So from the time the user clicks to the time the user downloads and opens the downloaded app, there is a delay. And during the point of delay, the same ad might be shown to the same user from a different ad network while the user is in an another experience. Right? So now, there is a conflict as to which ad network gets credit for that install. Right? Both the multiple ad networks are saying that, I showed the ad to this user. I need to get paid for this install. So typically, how this problem is solved in the mobile ecosystem is by using a third party attribution provider. Some of the examples include Tune and Adjust. What happens is that every ad network sends an event to their attribution partner every time a user clicks on an ad. And then the, adverti uh, the, and, and the advertiser themselves sends an event to the attribution partner when the user installs the ad. Now, this attribution partner needs to do the job of arbitration. Who gets to get the credit for install? And typically, and there is a variety of attribution methods being used. But the co most common one is to use last click attribution. What I mean by last click attribution is that 
which ad network gave the most recent or the last click just before the install happened. An install here means the user opening up the downloaded app and playing the game. That's what we consider an install event. So that's what happens here. Moving on, let's talk a little bit more about what's happened in the data slash modeling world. So we saw about how an ad is served by the ad server. We saw about how all the events are getting logged into the Kafka. And from Kafka, the data is getting sucked into a Hive slash HDFS data mart. Typically, there are, if I want to uh, divide the, uh, the pipelines that are running into, in the Hadoop cluster into four categories, uh, I can divide the uh, pipelines into four categories. There is a set of pipelines that are running that are generating uh, metrics. Right, it's aggregations uh, by, uh, for like, what is the impression count? What is the click count? What is the install count by different dimensions? Right? Some of these metrics are generated real time by Spark streaming applications, and some of them are generated in batch mode uh, using Hive and Airflow. So that's one common uh, use case. The second use case that we do is the budgeting pipeline. What happens here is that we have a real time streaming pipe, which reads the events, money, or transaction events, right, and aggregates those transactions by the advertising campaign. Right? We want to know how much money uh, uh, an advertising campaign has spent. Right? And those aggregations are written back to a new Kafka topic. The data that is written into the new Kafka topic will typically look like advertising campaign ID and uh, spend for today. That data is read back by the ad server to use, uh, to, an ad server uses that information to determine when to stop a campaign um, as it reaches close to its daily budget limits. So that's this third path as shown in this diagram. The, couple, the other popular use cases that are going on in the data land are machine learning and audience targeting. The, the second path that we are showing here is a machine learning path where we read impressions, clicks, and installs over the last 30 days from a Spark pipeline right, and train a logistic regression machine learning model. And the job of the logistic regression machine learning We'll probably go a little bit more deeper into the subsequent slides, but it is used to compute a model that is in turn used by the ad server to compute install probability or predicted eCPM for different advertising campaigns given an ad request. And we use that to rank the campaigns and compute the best performing ad. The top pipeline shown here is the audience targeting pipeline. What we do here is have a real-time Spark streaming pipe that reads boot up events. I want to spend a little bit of time explaining what a boot up event here means. In the mobile world, a boot up is an event that the SDK emits every time a user opens up a game, gaming app. So every time a user opens up a gaming app, that boot up event generated is read by a Spark streaming pipe and written to a uh, a key value store, we use Dynamo here. Here the Dynamo is indexed by device ID, and for every device ID, for every app, we store a bunch of uh, data points, like the boot up count, uh, in-app purchases, the last boot up count, uh, the install date, and we use these informations to do a, a, a variety of interesting things. Let's double click a little bit more into the machine learning pipeline and the audience targeting pipeline. OK, so first we begin with the machine learning pipeline. So the goal of the ad selection is to choose the best ad given an ad request. The keyword used here is best. So how, what, how do we know which is the best ad to uh, show? So let's step back a little bit. What is Chartboost Ad Server is trying to do? Right? It is, on one hand, we have publishers whose goal is to maximize revenue. They, are here, they, they have already a game 
which is having a, a large set of users, and they want to make as much money as possible, which is measured in terms of uh, ECPM, or money made per thousand impressions. Right? On the other hand, we have advertisers who are releasing a new gaming app and are interested in getting more and more installs at a lower price point. And not only that, they're also interested to maximize ROI. And ROI here means the quality of the install. They are not interested in getting installs where a user comes, installs an app, plays for a few minutes, and then quits the app and never returns back. They don't want such installs. Instead, they are interested in paying more for the installs where the user downloads the app and engages deeply with that app and makes a ton of in-app purchases. So we have pretty different goals for a publisher and a pretty different goals for advertisers. And Chartboost in the middle is trying to match and align these goals. So before going deeper, let's double click a little bit more about what is ECPM. So ECPM, which, which means expected revenue per or cost per thousand impressions. I say expected because it is the probability that this ad is going to make money in future over the next thousand impressions. So it's a predicted uh, value and not the real value. That's computed by multiplying the install percentage with the, the money per install or bid per install with thousand. So in this equation, uh, both the, uh, the thousand multiplier and the bid are constants. What I mean by that is that the advertiser, as part of building a campaign, chooses a bid value for every install that the campaign gets. That's not changing. And the mul thousand multiplier is also not changing. What's changing is the install probability, which is what we are going to compute using, our, uh, using a variety of algorithms. So how can we compute this install probability? So in a, in a very, very simple world, what will happen is that we have here two advertising campaigns. At the top, we have a bunny pop rewarded playable campaign. And in the second row has a, a KOA PGT video campaign. Uh, the top one has an install probability of 0.5%, while the second one has an install probability of 0.1%. However, the bunny pop advertiser is paying a, a, a CPI of a dollar twenty-five cents, while uh, KOA is paying a, a CPI of nine dollars and fifty cents. So, when we use that formula, ECPM formula, we get a predicted ECPM of six dollars for bunny pop, while we get a predicted probability of fourteen dollars for KOA. So, here. Um, the second um, advertiser wins because he has a, a better predicted ECPM. So this is a very simplistic world, but the real world is a lot more complex. What happens, so what I mean by that is that this is looking at the advertising campaign um, across the network. But in real world, what happens is that the performance of the advertising campaign varies significantly by different dimensions. A particular advertiser will perform really well for a particular publishing app, or for a particular set of OS, or in a particular set of geo countries, and whatnot. So here, I'm going into an example of the performance of the same advertiser app by different publishing app. So we are taking Racing Penguin as the publishing app, and we are taking the same two advertiser, Bunny Pop and KOA. In this case, because the install probability is now in, in this uh, racing penguin publishing app is so different, by using the same uh, formula to complete predicted ECPM, here the bunny pop uh, is performing significantly better. So when we looked at the whole network, the KOA advertiser was performing much well. But when I looked at the racing penguin publishing app, uh, actually bunny pop is performing much better. Now, so in this case, Bunny Pop is the winner. Now, if I extend this with a variety of features or variables, country, publishing app, publishing category, user preference, connection speed, creative, ad format, device model, platform, and many, many more, right? The, each of these variables is important, right? When I expand all these things, quickly the function to compute the install probability by these variables becomes complex. And this is where we use machine learning. 
So we, how do we do that? So we take um, the historic impression data and uh, extract variables. We use uh, Spark, uh, Scala code to extract the variables. The variables here include um, uh, advertising campaign, publishing app, ad type, country, right? And we train a model. What do we mean by train a model? Basically, here, uh, training a model means that we use an algorithm, in this case, logistic regression, to compute um, or learn a mapping between these variables to install uh, probabilities. Right? So that's what we mean here. Once we determine a model, what we are going to do is that we are going to use the same uh, model and the same feature extraction code inside ad server um, to score the advertising campaigns. Let me spend a little bit of time on what that means. Given an ad request, there could be a variety of eligible campaigns. Now we need to determine which campaign to be returned. We take each advertising campaign and then extract the different variables for that ad request, like publishing app, ad type, and country, and use the uh, model where the model has a set of weights for these different features and compute the install probability. And from install probability, we compute the predicted eCPM, and we use that to rank all these advertising campaigns and return the best performing advertising campaign. OK, some real world learnings. So we had a very interesting journey. Um, the first mistake, um, there are, are a mistake and a power that Spark gives is that Spark provides you a distributed machine learning ability. With that, what happens is that you get um, a power to run machine learning at a very, very large scale. So we um, started our journey by training a model with advertiser-publisher combo, which quickly generated into some 30 million features. And we trained um, a model where we hashed down 30 million features into 1.5 million feature buckets and trained a Spark model uh, uh, for those uh, 1.5 million feature hash buckets. Quickly, the model became too complex. We, it was very hard to troubleshoot, figure out what was going on. Um, we are not able to trouble, uh, do coefficient deep dives and analyze how the coefficients are looking for different features. Right? Additionally, we were also using different models to uh, train different kinds of campaigns. Right? Like we were like, uh, the, the really big top advertising campaigns were trained using a specific model, while uh, some other uh, smaller advertising campaigns were trained using a different uh, machine learning model. And what that brings is that different models have different variance and different distribution. Right? And so to combine the uh, eCPM scores from all these models and rank becomes an, became a nightmare. So what we did, we simplified. Simplicity is the key. Right? And even though you have a lot of power with the distributed machine learning, simplify things. So what we did was that first step we did was that we used a technique called frequency filtering, where we looked only at the features that are seen enough number of times in the training data and trashed all the other features that, did not, that were not seen uh, uh, enough. And additionally, we used uh, we, we categorized the publishing app into big publishing app and small publishing app and used a specific one particular modeling function to score all the advertising campaigns for an ad request. This avoided mixing models per request and greatly uh, simplified the model. We also lifted feature hashing, which enabled us to do coefficient analysis, and we saw a significant lift in the model performance. Um, before going into the second use case, I want to say one last word here. Um, so we spoke a lot about the model, uh, models for predict, use, uh, IPM prediction. We also are working on uh, ROI and LTV predictions. Right? Advertisers care about not just installs, but advertisers care about high quality installs. Like They care about purchasers, acquiring those purchasers. They're ready, willing to pay more for those purchasers. So doing ROI analysis, uh, so we want to bake into our model uh, 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 so that we can, we, can, um, predict the, uh, uh, we can predict the users who are willing to, who are going to make lots of purchases in the game and charge 
differently for those users with the advertiser. So that's a pretty complex topic. It's meant to be explained in a separate, different session. So I'm not going into that in this today's session. Um, but I just want to say that that's a fairly complex machine learning topic, and we are working on that. Moving on, uh, I want to spend a little bit more time into audience targeting. So there are two sub-products within, within the audience targeting. Number one is, uh, uh, we call it PGT, which is also known as player group targeting. And the number two is affinity. It's also known as lookalike targeting. Um, so in the, with the, let's talk a little bit about what is a player group targeting. Um, what we do is that we look at the behavior of different uh, uh, behavior of the different devices in different gaming apps and group these devices into different gaming interest profiles and make those gaming interest profiles available as segments to advertisers or marketers so that marketers can have ability to run their advertising campaign to specific users with specific gaming interests that's what uh, player group targeting is the second one is affinity or collaborative filtering. Here, what we want to uh, provide is, if we're given an advertising app, we want the, uh, uh, to uh, identify the set of users who had deeper engagement in other gaming apps that are similar in nature to the advertiser's app. Right? So, and make those users available for targeting with the marketer. That's what we do in affinity. So let's double click a little bit into how those work. So at a very high level, uh, we call this component persona. It has four components to it. It has a real-time stream, it has a batch loader, and it has a key value store. We use DynamoDB for that. And it has a, a serving side uh, evaluation component. We, have, we call it persona jar here. Let's double click a little bit more. So in the DynamoDB or a key value store, there are two tables. There is a device table and a segment table. The device table is indexed by device ID. And it has a bunch of information for every app that the user has visited, like the number of times that the user is playing that app, uh, the last time the user played the app, the first time the user installed the app, uh, the, amount of, the amount of in-app purchases the user has made in that app. right? And the segment, uh, before we are talking about segment table, let's talk a little bit about what a segment is. Segment, in its simplest form, is a rule string. Right? It captures a set of business logic that can be evaluated at runtime using the information available in the user table or device table. That's what a segment is. So for example, for player group targeting, we can define a segment saying that, uh, uh, it, saying that hey, this segment will evaluate it true if that device or user had 100 plus boot ups in casino category, meaning uh, casino kind of apps, and has some in-app purchases greater than $10 in, again in, from casino apps. So only if the user has had a lot of uh, uh, game plays in casino apps and have done some in-app purchases, this segment will get evaluated to true for this user. Now, if the marketer is targeting this segment, then what that means is the marketer is targeting users who are big time casino users. That's how uh, 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 we use this segmentation and persona stream to support this product. A Little bit more. So before going into that, let's talk a little bit about affinity targeting or lookalike targeting. So here, what we are saying is that, the, uh, say, um, there is an advertiser, um, A, who wants to um, target um, uh, uh, affinity users. What he, means, what, what he wants to do is that he wants to find users who had a D7 retention. And D7 retention means seventh day engagement. So the advertiser wants to target users who had positive D7 retention in apps that are similar in nature to the advertising app. So that's what the advertiser's goal here is. Now, how do we do that? We first define a segment that is similar, that, that looks something like this. Like uh, there is an affinity score between uh, two uh, between uh, uh, app app pairs. So we want that which determines how similar these apps look like. And I'll go a little bit more deeper into that and use that 
to find out if the user had an engagement in those similar apps. Let's find out more about the building blocks of the affinity targeting product. So there are four uh, blocks here. There is a user profile. Again, we talked a lot about that. Like This is stored in DynamoDB, and we have a bunch of information stored by device ID and app ID in DynamoDB. That's what we talk about in user profile. Then there's a targeting profile. This is what the segments mean here. And I talked about how you can define different kinds of rules in the segment string. Right? In the case of affinity segment, we will define a rule that targets similar looking apps. Right? And that's what goes into a targeting profile. And then there's an app to app affinity. So we're going to run a model to determine how we can group similar looking apps. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the final layer is device validation, right? A component inside an ad server that reads all of this and computes uh, whether this uh, particular device is eligible to show this advertising app or not. Let's double click more. So what is this? So we build a huge user to app array, right? Where here one means that that particular user had a positive D7 retention for that app. Zero means that that particular user did not have a positive D7 retention for that app. And X means that the user did not install that app. Right? So we build this array. And from this array, we compute conditional probability uh, for a user to return uh, on, uh, on day seven for an app A, given that the user had a positive D7 retention on app B. Right? So that's what we do here. And the formula is over here. So a little bit more. Using the conditional probabilities, we compute app to app affinity score. So here, app one is cookie jam, and app two is juice jam. And based on the, the affinity score of 0.6 is the conditional probability of the user, um, uh, conditional probability across a large set of users. OK, so this is how a user profile looks like inside Dynamo. We talked about that. Right, it typically has all the information about boot up count, last boot up date, install date, and a bunch of other information by device ID and app ID in the DynamoDB. This is how uh, uh, affinity segment looks like. Right, so we typically want to say that um, this is the advertiser app, and we want to capture similar apps where the app to the advertiser apps affinity score is greater than uh, some threshold. Here, in this case, it's 0.3. Right? And use that to evaluate the users who had a D7 retention in those similar apps. And then there is this um, Scala code that is sitting in inside ad server that takes the user profile, that takes this target uh, segment string, and determines if this uh, advertising campaign is eligible to be shown uh, for this user. Um, that's pretty much the magic here. Uh, that kind of uh, uh, summarizes most of the thing that we wanted to say. Let me recap a little bit. We started with saying, uh, providing an overview of Chartboost and how advertising works at Chartboost. Then we talked about the high level architecture of Chartboost, the building blocks of ad tech, and how uh, apps, ad serving, and uh, data components are architected at Chartboost. Then we double click a little bit more into machine learning at Chartboost, and audience targeting products at Chartboost, which is where Spark is heavily used. Um, and that brings an end to uh, uh, today's uh, presentation of ad tech at Chartboost. Now I'll open it up for Q&A. We use DynamoDB for we use Dynamo for segments. Um, yes. Is that too expensive? Uh, so uh, let me repeat the question. The question is that, hey, did you use uh, Dynamo for segments? That looks uh, expensive. So what happens is that we use Dynamo to store the segments, but we are not making any lookups. As you said, it is expensive. So we read the, all the uh, segments. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of segments. So we read all those segments uh, once and get sucked into uh, ad server memory. 
and use that to process. So we are not making a lookup to segments table every time, but we are making a lookup to user table every time. I think there are more questions. How are uh, Spark streaming uh, failures or spikes happening? So the question is, how are Spark streaming uh, failures or uh, spikes handled, right? So it really, again, it uh, depends on what failures or what spikes talking about. But I'll talk a, a couple of them that I'm aware of. Um, so often, uh, some of the spikes happens due to the increase and decrease in the data volume. And we use uh, uh, back pressure uh, to make sure that the data gets skewed up in Kafka. Uh, if, uh, if we are having uh, processing delays or if you're having spike in data volume. Um, errors, um, again, it depends really on what errors we are sp uh, speaking about here. There is a variety of errors uh, that can happen. Right? Uh, typically, for most analytics pipeline, what we have is that a streaming pipe followed by a batch pipe so that if streaming runs into a problem, then there's an hourly batch pipe that can catch up and fix those errors. So I have two related questions, actually. Okay. Uh, one is that you mentioned that simplicity is the key. And uh, I, could, I could relate it maybe to the logistic regression that you use rather than more complex algorithms. Uh, and how do you think, like, the first question, how do you think how your prediction would be improved if you use, like, uh, gradient boosted trees, random forests, so higher level? Okay, so let me repeat the question. Um, the qu first question is that, um, in terms of um, uh, uh, so simplicity, we are using logistic regression. And the first question is that, do we believe uh, that the model performance will be better if we end up using gradient boost or random forest? That's the question one. Um, and the answer is that we do believe that gradient boost <laughs> Again, we believe, we haven't yet fully tried out. We believe that gradient boost will help us out in, in terms of, and will provide us some lift in model performance. Right? That's early belief. We haven't yet run, tested it out and run in production yet. Also, if you look at Kaggle papers and stuff, uh, gradient boost is one of the popular winning models in all the uh, competitions. Right? So we believe in that, but uh, we had, again, uh, examples and competition is one thing. Running it at scale in a, in a business is another thing, and we haven't yet reached that point. And then the second question was, uh, precision. yeah, what is the, uh, so you're talking about precision or AUC? No, precision. Okay, so you're looking for AUPR. Um, I believe we have, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I believe around 0.1 or something. Right? I, I might be off here with the specific number. Yeah, I, I, I'm, 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 I don't want to give you a wrong number. I don't remember of the. 0.1% was the statistical error of your uh, prediction. Yeah, yeah. So I, again, I, I mean, it's a good question. I don't want to give you a wrong number. I don't remember off the top of my head. So the training model you mentioned, and you said the extracted variables. Would you mind elaborate a bit more on the extracted variables? Uh, is that a manual process, an automatic process, and where the variables itself came from and the features itself? Yeah, so it is not a, um, again, it depends, right? So there is a, so let me repeat the question. So the question is that the feature, is the feature extraction manual or automated, right? That's the specific question that's being asked. Um, again, the, the answer is depends, right? So there's a whole set of feature extraction that we do that is automated from Spark Scala code, right? And we use that inside Ad Server because even the request that is Ad request coming in doesn't have the features that we need in a, in a readily available form, and we need to do a bunch of translation from Ad request to the set of features we need. Right? And we use the same code again in our model training to extract those features from the data events uh, and train the model. Right? However, 
uh, that is like some feature translations or feature variations that we do uh, during a lab uh, to find out if these features are going to be helpful or not, right? So initially we do that some of those manually, but eventually everything gets automated. Would that be the data scientist's job to do that, or would that be a business person's job to do that when the, the manufacturer? Yeah, we we typically do that with data scientists and data engineers uh, at Chartbus. Yeah, go ahead. Imagine you are we're in the future uh, and you're giving this from three years from now. What will change? What is your feeling? What will change? It's an abstract question again. Right? Yeah. Uh, three years from now. Where are we going? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So the industry, the mobile gaming industry, um, uh, like in the next six months or one year, we are doing a lot of work in ROI optimizations and LTV optimizations. Uh, in one of the other uh, university data science conferences I attended, there were a bunch of folks from Lyft and other companies who were all talking about how to do LTV optimizations, right? LTV optimization is a pretty complex uh, challenge that most of the folks in the mobile world are working on. Right? Uh, I also see, believe that more and more uh, mobile and mobile gaming and VR um, will merge um, or will align and there will be the, that VR will bring in a new set of challenges that I can't predict what at this point of time. So that's what I think. Any other questions? So the question is that what, are, what is the key used in AeroSpike uh, key value store? And then how do we, the second question was that, how do we tag if the same user is using uh, multiple devices, right? So the AeroSpike is also keyed by device ID, right, IDFA that we get from our SDK. And again, uh, AeroSpike stores a bunch of information for every device, like the apps that the device has installed or the impressions and clicks and installs that the device has seen or clicked, right? So that's what is getting stored by device ID in AeroSpike. And uh, the second question uh, you asked was, um, how, do you tag? Yeah, how do you tag if there are multiple uh, devices for the same user? So that's where cross-device mapping comes in. Uh, today, we do not do that. Like if the same user is having multiple devices, we consider that as two different users or two, with two different device IDs, right? But uh, there's a lot of innovation going on in that space, right? Based on uh, IP of those devices and a bunch of other metadata, uh, some companies are trying to map that these different device IDs belong to the same user or belong to the same household. What but we don't do that. What is the reality of the models? You, when you're asking granularity, time granularity, or? No, at an ad level or at a campaign level. Okay, so the question is what is the granularity at which uh, we create models? Is it at an ad level or at a campaign level? Uh, today we are creating at a campaign level. Okay, so how many campaigns and how many ads? So we have about uh, 30,000 campaigns, um, but we don't create it for every campaign, right? This is where as part of simplification of the models, we focus on the, the top campaigns that make the most impression and most revenue and group the rest of them into a set of categories. Okay. I'm still learning data science, so my questions are like really basic questions. So what was your intuition behind choosing logistic data since you have so many available algorithms to choose Yeah, so the question is that, why did we choose a logistic regression? Um, the answer is that it is one of the simplest machine learning models, right? Um, while some complex models like gradient boost or other, other complex algorithms, neural nets, random forests can give a better performance, uh, bulk of the performance comes from using the model correctly, using the right features, uh, reducing the noise in the model, Right? And you can do all these things 
more easily if you have a simpler model. And that was the reason for that. I have a second question related to the data. Like when I do my projects, it's generally the number of variables is within my class. So I can look at the plots and decide what's good and what's not. So when you have like more than a million variables, as you said, like you need good features to get better performance from a single model. So like with more than a million variables, how do you manage that part of the data? So question is, how do you troubleshoot and look at the data and graphs and do coefficient analysis when you have a large number of features? Is that a yeah. question? So when you are not able to comprehend all of the variables, uh, but look at each one of them and analyze them. Correct. So we look at e by each feature variable by different dimensions, by different geos, by different publisher sets, by different publisher groups, right? So look at. If, if you look at this entire room as a set of million features, look at different bubbles and analyze that. That's my uh, simplest answer, right? I mean, we'll have to probably spend more time explaining what that means. But look at different areas of, of a feature set and see how the performance is in that, in that bubble. Any other question? So how many of your features are streamed? Can you repeat the question? How many of your features are screened? How many are batched? Uh, for machine learning? Yes. So in the machine learning, uh, we are currently using mostly batch um, that are trained every few hours. Um, in the audience targeting pipeline, we are using streaming features. So all the features in the targeting pipeline are streamed? Correct. Okay. Any other questions? No. So the question is, how many features are we using to train the model, and are we using dimension reduction? Yeah. yeah, so we are currently using million plus features, and we are using dimension reduction. We are using frequency filtering. We are using if we don't do anything, it will be in the 30 million range, right? So we are using like we are doing first using something like look at top advertisers and top publishers, and then group the other rest of them into some big category buckets. We are also doing some frequency filtering right, to reduce the number of feature set that, that is getting loaded into a model. So, uh, when you do dimension reduction, is it, is it more intuition driven or is it more machine learning driven? Uh, it is, the question is uh, on what basis we are reducing the features. Uh, it's based on two things. What other features uh, are uh, feature variables that are part of a significant number of impressions or contribute to significant revenue, right? And that are, have a lot of statistically significant data, right? So avoid the features that are sparse, that are nice, or group them into some bigger buckets. That's what was primarily drove those feature reduction. I think we are 10 minutes over, so I want to wind up the Q&A session. Uh, thank you, folks.